Hello, Weirdo family. Today, through October 24th, I'll be away from the Weird Darkness studio filming a horror movie, so I won't be able to give updates on our Overcoming the Darkness fundraiser in the podcast, as I had to produce these episodes in advance. But don't let that stop you from donating. I will give an update when I get back from filming. In the meantime, if you'd like to follow me and how things are going on the movie set while I'm gone, I'll be posting updates and pics as often as I can to the Weird Darkness Facebook page. I'll place a link to that in the episode description. And now, on with the show. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Most people do not know what demonic possession is actually like. For the most part, the concept of possessions and exorcisms comes from what we see in movies and books. But for some people, possessions and exorcisms are frighteningly real. Exorcisms came to everyone's attention with the release of the 1973 film based on the book, which drew from the real-life exorcism of 13-year-old Roland Doe of Cottage City, Maryland in 1949. The book and film were, of course, The Exorcist. No one knows the boy's true identity, as his name was changed to Roland Doe to protect his privacy. Roland Doe's possession began following the death of his aunt. He turned to a Ouija board to communicate with her, but he apparently invited something much more sinister in. Shortly after, he began hearing scratching noises inside his bedroom walls, and his mattress started moving erratically on its own. As the possession worsened, Roland began demonstrating violent, superhuman strength. Roland's parents sought help from Father E. Albert Hughes, who requested permission from the church to conduct an exorcism. The ritual became violent, and Roland tore a spring off of his mattress and used it to slash Father Hughes across the shoulders. The family then headed to St. Louis and saw three more priests who, with permission, carried out about 30 exorcisms on Roland. The priests reported that his outbursts only occurred at night. He had messages written on his skin, guttural voices, and extreme strength. He would also become enraged at the sight of religious iconography and would make the items fly across the room. The exorcisms became worse and worse, with Roland wetting his bed and violently cursing at the priests. But one final exorcism worked a miracle. The ritual took seven minutes, and the priests observed Roland coming out of his trance-like state and simply stated, he's gone. Afterward, Roland Doe experienced a vision of St. Michael defeating the devil and never suffered from this possession again. Unfortunately, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people today who are seeking help from the Catholic Church, asking for demons to be exorcised from themselves or loved ones. And demonic possession is only on the rise, growing in number year by year. But at the same time, there are fewer and fewer priests being trained in the practice. So where does that leave us? I'm Darren Marlar. And this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos. This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, what do extraterrestrials have to do with vampires? Would you believe an alien vampire hybrid? It's just one of several conspiracy theories regarding vampire bloodlines, and the family trees go back for centuries. Today, the fully restored Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, creates an ambiance that has transcended time while providing all the amenities that the modern-day traveler requires. Surrounded by 15 acres of formal gardens and nature trails, the hotel offers 72 guest rooms, many with their own balcony, and 12 luxury suites throughout the building. The New Moon Spa features a full menu of treatments, a salon, and a wellness program. And 
a few ghosts. Exorcists are trained to deal with some of the darkest, most evil entities to ever exist. They're casting out demons, after all. But even in those situations, there are cases that rise to the top as the most terrifying and disturbing, with one even worse than the exorcist would portray. But first, if you feel a loved one is demonically possessed and you've made sure it's not a physical or mental condition causing the issue, the logical next step is to find a priest to perform an exorcism. But not just any priest is allowed by the Catholic Church to perform such rites, and those who are allowed are dwindling in number, with fewer and fewer clergy stepping forward to take on such a role. So what is the Vatican to do? Easy. Start offering classes. We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Demonic possessions are on the rise, and Italy is going berserk. The country is experiencing an uptick in individuals claiming to be possessed by demons. So, obviously, more and more trained Catholic priests are needed for exorcisms. Since there are not enough priests to keep up with demand, the Vatican now offers week-long exorcism training courses in Vatican City. If you ever wanted to learn how to be an exorcist, the time is now. Destiny is calling. These exorcism courses will likely leave you with lifelong memories about demonic presences and lost souls. Before you make a final decision to take one, though, you may want to know more about what's happening in Italy. The Catholic Church first put exorcism guidelines on paper in 1614, later revising them in 1999. The rules were published in a leather-bound text. The course aims to outline the signs of possession, the reasons why the media shouldn't be involved with exorcism rituals, and the instructions for the actual casting out. Reportedly, the course discusses why consultation with mental health physicians is important, but the actual ritual hasn't changed. Vatican City priests are involved with exorcisms quite frequently. In fact, Friar Beningo Palia claims that there are usually half a million yearly requests for exorcisms in Italy. He believes that the number has grown in the last few years because people are less spiritual. Allegedly, people also dabble in the occult more often. Palia says the priesthood doesn't typically prepare the clergy for exorcism, though. Many younger clergy members aren't even interested in the practice. Consumer organization Codacons reported in 2014 and 2017 that Italians were dealing with the economic crisis by visiting proprietors of the paranormal for guidance. In fact, it's estimated that 13 million Italians visit occult healers, gurus, fortune tellers, and tarot card readers every year. Friar Beningo Palia says that these practices invite evil and demonic forces. France has an estimated 100 licensed exorcists but many of them are inactive. To combat this shortage, independent exorcists have popped up to perform demon unloading services. Many of these freelance exorcists charge exorbitantly for their services, although the Catholic Church doesn't recommend them. An hour of house purification may cost about $178, while specialty farmhouse cleanses may cost about $616. However, the church warns that unlicensed exorcists could make grave mistakes. They may even be scam artists. The International Association of Exorcists claims to have over 400 Vatican-approved demon busters. However, that number can't begin to even address the 500,000 yearly possessions in Italy. Countries like France, Mexico, and the United States also report increases in demonic experiences. 
In order to satisfy the demand for exorcisms, the Church hopes to triple the number of certified exorcists. The Pope is vocal about many progressive views, but he also voices support for the teaching of exorcism rites. The Pope even held a Vatican training seminar in March 2017 that touched on exorcism. Priests were taught how to listen to confessions. They were also lectured about the importance of taking parishioners' words seriously, especially if demonic possession was mentioned. Though the Pope recognizes that mental disorders may be involved with alleged possessions, he told priests not to delay in referring people to exorcists if the need is genuine. The collection of Roman Catholic churches in America also faced a shortage of qualified exorcists. To combat the issue, the church hosted a 2010 two-day training course in Baltimore, Maryland. About 56 bishops and 66 priests attended the conference on the liturgical and pastoral practice of exorcism. A New York Archbishop's assistant also took part in the event. Prior to 2010, only about six priests in the U.S. were licensed to perform exorcisms. In 2016, the number rose to 21. Italian priest Pauline Gabrielle Amorth started holding meetings with other exorcists to share experiences and tips concerning the art of exorcism. In 1990, Amorth founded the official International Association of Exorcists. His exorcism conferences started in 1994. The Vatican officially recognized Amforth's group in 2014. Over 400 exorcists from about 30 countries work together to rid the world of demonic presences. Italy houses 240 members of the association. The director of the exorcist film, William Friedkin, told attendees at a 2016 Cannes Film Festival master class that he filmed a real Catholic exorcism. Allegedly, he received a special invitation. Friedkin claimed that the ritual he witnessed was very similar to his classic 1973 film. The Vatican denied this event, suggesting that another Catholic organization sent the invitation. However, the guidelines for exorcism are undeniably similar to the actions of the priests in the Hollywood film. Holy water is sprinkled, the priest lays hands on the victim, a crucifix is employed, and the demon is commanded to leave. When exorcisms were first recognized by the Catholic Church and the Vatican in 1614, the Latin text did not mention psychological ailments. When the guidelines were rewritten in 1999, priests were told to seek the help of non-religious experts before requesting permission to perform an exorcism. In fact, the new exorcism primer encourages priests to speak with psychologists and other mental health providers first who have a sense of spiritual reality so that mental maladies can be treated appropriately. Sicilian priest Beningo Polia believes that priests should serve an apprenticeship with a more experienced exorcist after learning about exorcisms. Senior priests already have a say in whether or not exorcisms can be performed at all, so it makes sense to train alongside those skilled in interpreting the signs of possession. Some priests, such as Vincenzo Terraborelli, have been performing exorcisms for decades. Their insights and experiences could prove invaluable to a new generation of exorcists. Some priests have only seen a handful of exorcisms. However, they warn that there are three other demonic activities that may require the attention of a clergy member. Infestation occurs when a demon moves items around, frightening people with noises. Vexation occurs when a demon gets physical with a victim, leaving bruises, scratches, and other marks on the body. Obsession occurs when a demon mentally attacks a victim, forcing the afflicted to have evil thoughts. Bishop Thomas Paprocki believes that all exorcisms are either major or minor. Major exorcisms require church approval because the exorcists speak directly to the demon with the authority of God. Minor exorcisms are surprisingly common and include baptism. Paprocki says that minor exorcisms involve rejecting Satan and all his works. So, are you ready to become an exorcist now? Before you jump in with all your soul and spirit, you might want to hear the story of one exorcism consultant's case about the creepiest exorcism he was ever involved in. Up next. Plus, what do extraterrestrials have to do with vampires? Would you believe an alien-vampire hybrid? 
It's just one of several conspiracy theories regarding vampire bloodlines, and the family trees go back for centuries. Weird Darkness is celebrating its ninth birthday this month, and we mark that on our calendars by holding a fundraiser each year in October. We raise money for organizations that help people who struggle with depression, anxiety, and thoughts of suicide and self-harm. It's called Overcoming the Darkness, and you can make a donation right now at WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. A gift of any amount will bring us that much closer to our goal of $5,000, and every dollar you give helps someone affected by depression, so no gift is too small. You can help us celebrate the podcast's birthday, celebrate the darkness of Halloween, and also help people climb out of the darkness that they're trapped in. To donate or get more information about overcoming the darkness and watch a video I created about it, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. The fundraiser ends Halloween night at midnight, so please, give right now while you're thinking about it. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. One of the creepiest exorcism cases that doesn't get the focus that it deserves is that of Dr. Richard Gallagher's work with Julia, a woman who was possessed by an incredibly intelligent demon. This case is one of the real exorcisms that were worse than The Exorcist, and it completely changed the mindset of a psychiatrist who didn't believe that people could actually be possessed by demons. The story of Julia is not only one of the worst exorcisms to ever be recorded, it is also one of the few stories that delves into what it's really like to work on an exorcism case. The case spanned multiple exorcisms, and the people who were trying to save Julia lived thousands of miles away from each other. Telling you any more would ruin how weird and crazy this story gets, so just listen on as this exorcism consultant shares the story of the worst case he ever worked on. Gallagher was brought in to meet Julia, a woman who dressed in flowing black robes and put on black eyeshadow that went back to her temples. She referred to herself as the high priestess of a satanic cult, which made Gallagher immediately skeptical of her claims. His skepticism began to fade, though, when he met Julia and she immediately began to point out the secret weaknesses of everyone in the room. After that, she began to guess the way that people whom she had never met had died. Gallagher says that Julia knew that his mother had passed away from ovarian cancer and that the possessed woman was known to speak multiple languages during exorcisms. One of the major criticisms lobbed at Dr. Gallagher's relationship with Julia is his insistence that she wasn't simply dealing with a major mental episode. He claims that it was much more likely that she was possessed by a demonic entity than it was that she was dealing with a psychotic episode, as Julia's trances were much more intense than a simple disassociation. He wrote in the New Oxford Review, "...mentally troubled individuals often dissociate, but Julia's trances were accompanied by an unusual phenomenon." out of her mouth would come various threats, taunts, and scatological language, phrases like, leave her alone, you idiot, she's ours, leave, you imbecile priest, or just leave. Gallagher continues, saying that Julia made sure to be as sacrilegious during her trances. When Julia's exorcism finally occurred, it allegedly had all the trappings of your classic Hollywood film. The room grew cold in the middle of the summer, Julia taunted Gallagher's team of priests and nurses in voices that didn't belong to her. She began to make guttural, animalistic noises. Supposedly, objects moved around the room at will, and to top it all off, when Julia came out of each one of her trances, she didn't remember anything that had happened. According to one source, Julia took on an extreme strength, 
making it so six people had to hold her down. The source also claims that she levitated. However, in Dr. Gallagher's article for the Washington Post, he says that he never saw anything like that happen. Before Dr. Gallagher's first meeting with Julia, he experienced an incredibly strange evening that would be a precursor for what followed. Gallagher claimed, "...the night before I first saw her, our cats went wild in the middle of the night. When I met her the next day, she asked me, Dr. Gallagher, how did you like those cats?" That's not the most auspicious beginning for a relationship, but it seems par for the course when you're dealing with demons. Gallagher continued, I told her if she was ever involved in doing anything like that again, I would refuse to assess her for her exorcist. That wasn't the only time that Julia messed with Dr. Gallagher's head, though, from thousands of miles away. He claims that one day when he was on the phone with Julia's exorcist, they suddenly heard her voice coming through the receiver. Gallagher says that she was screaming at the priest in a demonic voice. Aside from Julia's voices and the horrible things she would say to everyone during her eight exorcisms, she also had a penchant for describing things about the team assembled to help her that no one should know. During Julia's trances, she would display psychic abilities that absolutely freaked everyone out. In one case, she locked in on a priest who wasn't even in the house and began to describe where he was at and how he was feeling. Another priest who was directly involved with Julia's case was consistently reported on when Julia was in a trance. Despite not knowing that the priest suffered from a chronic illness, she would discuss how he was feeling, what he was doing, and even what he was wearing. Every case of demonic possession is different. Some demons are lower creatures who are simply lashing out at the corporeal world, while others are incredibly crafty creatures who want nothing more than to cause chaos. The demon inhabiting Julia was definitely an intelligent being that seemed hell-bent on destroying the faith of every member of the exorcism team. Proving the demon's intelligence, it allegedly knew when the priests were trying to trick it by throwing regular water at her and would only react to genuine holy water. She was also able to reveal the facts about the past of the attendees and provide a family history of everyone in the room. In most cases of exorcism, it's usually the family of a loved one who seeks out the Catholic Church in order to free their friend or family member from the clutches of demonic possession. In the case of Julia, it was the woman herself who went to a local priest. Gallagher believes that she was conflicted and that she wanted to be relieved of the possession. Gallagher later said that the whole case was strange because Julia continued to be involved with a satanic cult throughout her work with the Catholic Church. Julia was perfectly aware that she was possessed and she did not like that. It turned out that she refused to leave the cult, so she was not someone who was going to be helped. But she was also afraid of the cult. She was torn. Dr. Gallagher is open about how most of the patients he sees who may be possessed by a demon are dealing with a psychotic episode. Most of the people who believe they're being assaulted by demons are actually dealing with dissociative identity syndromes. Priests call this pseudo-possession. But make no mistake, that is a mental disorder. According to Dr. Gallagher, real possessions have telltale signs that are incredibly hard to fake. Things like levitation and having what he calls uncommon knowledge. Gallagher admits that he's never seen a person levitate, although he believes that some of his associates have witnessed this feat. After studying a patient, he'll let priests know whether or not the symptoms put off by the person he's studying can be medically explained or not, and leave it at that. However, in the case of Julia, things were not so cut and dried. Dr. Richard Gallagher is an Ivy League trained at Princeton and Yale psychiatrist working in Westchester County, New York, with a private practice. In an article in the Washington Post, he describes himself as a practicing Catholic and an admitted skeptic who doesn't believe in hocus-pocus. He believes this is why he was brought on to Julia's case. According to Gallagher, everyone involved didn't want this case to be about demonic possession, but they couldn't help it. Gallagher said the priest who had asked for my opinion of this bizarre case 
was the most experienced exorcist in the country at the time, an erudite and sensible man. Could it be that they were all having this faith tested by this alleged demon? According to Dr. Gallagher, he and his team of exorcists were not able to fully help Julia because she called off the exorcism. He claimed she was conflicted about receiving help from the church. She said that she enjoyed the power she received when she channeled the demonic entity possessing her body. Gallagher said that she was playing both sides, which seems like a reductive way of looking at the situation. Gallagher stated, "...exorcism is not some kind of magical incantation. Normally a person has to make their own sincere spiritual efforts, too." After calling off the exorcism, Gallagher said that he only heard from Julia one more time. She said that she was dying of cancer and was thinking about continuing her exorcism. Sadly, he never heard from her again. Most of us are familiar with vampires and the concept of supernatural entities who hide away by day and emerge at night to feed on the blood of the living so that it might enjoy eternal life. We see such images each Halloween, for example, and such a notion has formed the plot for many a movie for decades. However, the roots of Dracula are particularly bloody, and if you believe the conspiracies, darkly intriguing and intertwined with an ancient extraterrestrial presence. Perhaps more on point, if there is any truth at all to the claims of connections between vampirism and ancient blood sacrifices, they are actively disturbing. What's more, many real-life vampires, at least in their own minds, exist today in the modern world. The person we mostly associate with the origins of Dracula hails from what is now modern-day Romania near the Danube River Valley, Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Tepes, born in 1428. Vlad, ruler of Wallachia, near the region once referred to as Transylvania in the Carpathian Mountains, on three separate occasions between 1448 and 1477, is still one of history's most bloodthirsty people. His father was Prince of Wallachia, and perhaps more importantly, in terms of influence with elite circles of the time, was a member of the Order of the Dragon, a secret military society. From this association, he would become known as Vlad Dracul, or Vlad the Dragon. With similar undertones to the Knights Templar several centuries earlier, as well as other secret orders, the unofficial official duties of the Order of the Dragon was to seek out and confront heresy. They would also provide a fighting force against the forces of the Sultan of Turkey and, on occasion, against rival Christian kingdoms of Europe. By the time Vlad the Impaler fully assumed his throne in 1456, following years of internal political unrest and assassinations, of which his father Vlad Dracul was a victim, his use of torture was well known. In a bizarre twist, the two people perhaps responsible for instilling such a passion for spilling the blood of his enemies were two of his worst enemies, John Hunyadi, who was heavily involved in the assassination plot of his father, and the Sultan of Turkey, Murad II, who had taken charge of Vlad and his brothers at the behest of his father, an arrangement that led to his assassination for making such deals with the Turks. Incidentally, according to record, in the first days of his rule, a strange comet appeared over the capital of Wallachia. Whether the strange comet's appearance was coincidence, an omen, or even something more nuts and bolts, shortly after the incident, Vlad the Impaler would earn his sobriquet in the fullest and take firm control of the region in doing so. While the person on the throne of Wallachia changed over the years, the real power lay with such people as John Hanyadi the noblemen or the boyars. While Hanyadi was killed in battle several months previously, many similar noblemen whose influence was used to authorize the assassination of his father were still alive, and what's more, they fully expected the new ruler to be subservient to their desires. Vlad, though, had other ideas. He would summon all 500 such noblemen to his main castle residence in Turgovista, with his audience gathered in the main hall of the castle, 
At his signal, his guards appeared from outside on all sides and apprehended them. They were then systematically impaled on large wooden stakes. While some were impaled through the stomach and died relatively quickly, others had the stake inserted into their rectum before being raised up, their own weight then forcing them down the stake, the wooden pole slowly mangling their insides as it forced its way through their upper body. Some would take days to die. All 500 stakes were taken to the main courtyard and left on display to any who dare to challenge him. This treatment of enemies, and on occasion his own people alike, would be replicated many times during his reigns, during which he would become known as Draculea or Dracula, eventually becoming Dracula, which interesting or not translates to Dragon's Son or Devil's Son. The numbers of victims who would meet their ends at the hands of Vlad the Impaler or Dracula would be in the tens of thousands and furthermore, their rotting corpses were often left on display for approaching armies as a testament to the grisly fate that would await them. Perhaps the most disturbing reports, though, and likely where the association with drinking blood stems from, are the accounts of Vlad sitting to eat among his impaled victims, many of which were still alive although close to death. Not only that, he would dip bread in their blood, eating it along with his sickly meal. Furthermore, on occasion he would have the impaled victims arranged in very specific arrangements, often circular, and would stand and eat within them. This type of activity, particularly if we assume for a moment, would take place on specific days, has all the hallmarks of a ritual human sacrifice, of which the drinking of the blood is simply a part of. Might these rituals have their roots farther back in antiquity? particularly if we think about the region of the Black Sea, which is of such historical significance, as well as the mountainous regions of the area. These would serve as one of the main routes from Asia and the ancient mystery schools of Egypt and Babylon. Many of those making such journeys would become the monarchs and powerful families of Europe. In fact, others, while they don't doubt the authenticity of the accounts, believe the need for blood runs much deeper than mere brutal display. Before we look at those claims, though, we will examine briefly the most famous telling of the vampire legends, and more to the point, the author of it, when Weird Darkness returns. Every October, we take the month and raise funds for organizations that help people who struggle with depression. It's called Overcoming the Darkness. AZ wrote in a few years ago talking about our Overcoming the Darkness campaign. I can tell everyone that no matter what you think, there is a way out of depression. And I'm living proof. I spent 30 plus years in a funk so deep, there are large chunks of my life I simply don't remember. At times, it was just a feeling of sadness and impending doom. I thought of ways out, many times. I finally got tired of barely being alive. I talked to a doctor and began taking antidepressants. Now I rarely get depressed or stressed, and I no longer find myself not dreading tomorrow. This is why our Overcoming the Darkness campaign is so important. It supports organizations that help people who struggle with depression so that they too can start looking forward to tomorrow instead of dreading today. Please donate today, right now if you can. Go to WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. While the apparent roots of the character we know as Dracula goes back to the 1400s, it was 19th century writer Bram Stoker who brought the account, with a huge helping of fiction, to the wider world in his 1897 novel of the same name. Or did he? Many researchers in symbolism and esoteric knowledge claim that much of the fiction is disguising secret knowledge, and what's more, according to such theories, clues of this reside within Stoker's famous novel. 
For example, Dracula's ability to shapeshift or control the thoughts of others uh, – possess them, perhaps – is one of the most obvious similarities. The name, Count Dracula, is a clue of the activities of the noble and royal bloodlines, or the elite. At least according to some. His need for blood is a reference to such elites and their accused secret sacrificial rituals. Most often, Dracula enters through a window, which some believe is representative of a portal indicating an unearthly existence. This is a point that we'll look at further in a moment. Perhaps though most interestingly, as well as his intense interest in mysticism and the occult, he shared a close friendship with J. W. Brody Innes, who was a member of the short-lived but highly influential Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. This order would share rituals dating back to the ancient Egyptian era, much like many of the Masonic rituals of modern times. Perhaps it should be no surprise then to learn that several prominent members of this order were also Freemasons. And given the claims of many conspiracy researchers of secret esoteric Masonic knowledge, and more importantly how it is communicated, perhaps claims of fact intertwined with fiction are not as outlandish as they first seem. There's an increasing number of researchers, albeit very much on the fringes, who believe that the roots of Dracula and vampirism go further back than the 15th century. To some, the legends stretch right the way back to the dawn of time. The main drive of these theories is David Icke, who draws many comparisons with the legends of Dracula and vampires and his claims of reptilian aliens who require blood to keep their human form. There is, of course, an obvious comparison here to reptiles and their preference for eating live animals or warm blood. According to Ike, these reptilians, sometimes known as the Anunnaki, have ruled over humanity for hundreds of thousands of years. This rule stretches from the pharaohs of ancient Egypt right the way through to modern times. Today, these are members of the royal families of Europe and afar, as well as those with significant political influence. Furthermore, these reptilians assume human form – essentially they shapeshift – or even possess a person and do so from another dimension. It's tempting to dismiss such outlandish notions. There is, however, a very definite connection between the rulers of antiquity and those who control us in modern times. Furthermore, as a constant backdrop to these ruling elites and their secret societies is a tradition of ritual sacrifice as well as a constant referring to the serpent or the dragon. Even more intriguing, these reptilians supposedly hail from the Draco constellation. It doesn't take a genius to see the comparison to the word Dracula. Interestingly or not, Queen Mary, the grandmother of Queen Elizabeth II, descended from the sister of Vlad Dracula the Impaler. With the claims we've already made, make of that what you will. Perhaps one of the earliest real vampires in recorded history is from Anantis Castle. Some people claim it's Alnwick Castle. According to the historian of the 12th century William of Newburgh, there was a vampire who resided in the castle, and what's more, it would suck the blood of anyone who came across it. The body of the alleged vampire was in the graveyard itself, having once been a man from Yorkshire. Eventually, local residents would dig it up and note how bloated it appeared something they believed was due to the sheer amount of blood it had consumed. They would proceed to bash the body with their shovels, and so sending much of the blood flying in all directions. To ensure it was dead, they would then cut out its heart. Two centuries later, in the 1500s, the village of Blau in Bohemia would also suffer from visits of a vampire, at least according to legend. The vampire was a shepherd named Mislada in life. However, after his death, he returned to the village and began targeting the local residents. It's said he had the power to kill just by saying his victim's name. Eventually, his body was dug up and removed from the village before stakes were hammered through various parts of his body and he was set aflame. Another intriguing case of a vampire occurred the following century in the 1650s in Croatia. According to official records, a local man named Jura Grondo was a vampire and he let loose a reign of terror in the town of Istria for 16 years after his death. The reports of the era 
claimed that residents would complain of the undead man roaming the village as the locals slept, knocking on people's front doors. What's more, if such a knock should come, then the person inside the house would likely die shortly after. Records of the spree also state that one evening, led by a priest, Brando's corpse was dug up and his head cut off. While there is a mountain of claims of ritual human sacrifice and the so-called elites of society in conspiracy circles today, there are also several cases on record of individuals who have seemingly killed due to their uncontrollable urges for the taste of blood. Many of these didn't profess to be a vampire, nor were they part of some esoteric and chilling blood rituals. Their monikers, for the most part, are a reference to their particular brutal bloodlust. Peter Curtin, for example, known as the Vampire of Dusseldorf, claimed to be aroused by drinking blood. He was put to death for the nine murders in 1931. He also admitted to killing and drinking the blood of swans from public parks. Joshua Rudiger, on the other hand, very much believed he was a vampire. The California media would label him the Vampire Slasher during his killing spree in 1998. He'd go on to claim that he was a 2,000-year-old vampire who required blood for vitality. Rudiger would also state during his trial that prey is prey. Perhaps this shows how far he had truly distanced himself from the murder, a crime he would receive a sentence of over two decades behind bars for. The teenage vampire, Sean Sellers also claimed to be distanced from the crimes for which he was executed in 1999. After shooting dead a store clerk, he would go on to murder his parents in 1986. He would claim to be under the possession of the demon Uzerate. It would also come to light that he regularly cut his and others' wrists to drink the blood from them. There was no doubt of Richard Chase's intense interest in vampirism, and in a one-month period in 1977, he would murder six people in order to drink their blood, as well as committing cannibalism and necrophilia. Chase's obsession with drinking blood actually started as a young child, at least by the age of 10. He would regularly kill animals, any animal, with the sole purpose of wishing to drink their blood. Even more bizarre, this would eventually progress to injecting animal blood directly into himself. The reasons for this are thought to be his belief that it would cure the paranoid thoughts that seemingly plagued him throughout his life. In fact, it was because of this obsession with injecting the blood of animals into himself that he was held in a mental institution following him suffering blood poisoning after injecting himself with the blood of a rabbit. Interestingly, it was during this time while incarcerated that the staff at the facility would nickname him Dracula. Whether this contributed to him eventually progressing to killing humans in order to consume their blood is perhaps open to debate. By the time he was 27 years old, he had progressed to a desire for human blood. Chase would simply select his victims by trying unlocked doors while prowling the streets of Sacramento, California. The murders themselves were all horrific in the truest sense of the word. Not only would he drink his victims' blood, he would often perform sexual acts on his victims' dead bodies. One particularly harrowing victim was a pregnant woman who not only would he chase and kill, he would also eat parts of the flesh and organs. Chase would ultimately be sentenced to death for the six murders. However, he would take his own life by saving up his antidepressant medication for several weeks and then intentionally overdosing. Perhaps one of the most chilling aspects of the Chase murders certainly from a perspective of how many more victims there could have been had he not been caught, was the discovery of a calendar at his home. On this, the word TODAY was written on several dates, and they matched the dates of the six murders, meaning Chase had purposely chosen days to go hunting for a victim. Even more worryingly, there were over 40 other dates with the word TODAY written on them, stretching several months into the future. In 1996, Roderick Farrell would murder his girlfriend's father by bashing him repeatedly over the head with a crowbar in Murray, Kentucky. Upon his arrest, he would claim to be a 500-year-old vampire by the name of Visago. In fact, Farrell had met his victim's daughter, Heather Wendorf, after she'd run away from him and joined the vampire clan. 
The group had several members, and Farrell was the leader of it. They would even meet in an abandoned building with the words The Vampire Hotel crudely painted on it. It was here where the group would carry out strange rituals, including drinking blood, which all members had to do to join. Farrell would cut his own arm and then offer it to new recruits. Although only five of the group would be arrested and questioned over the murders, it's thought that their numbers swelled to at least 30 at the time of Farrell's arrest. The killings that Farrell was eventually found guilty of occurred during Thanksgiving week 1996. He, along with an accomplice, Scott, entered the home of Richard Wendorf and his partner Naomi. While Richard was asleep on the sofa, Farrell proceeded to rain down blows on his skull with a crowbar. Upon hearing the commotion, Ruth entered the room shortly after prompting Farrell to attack her in the same way. He was eventually arrested four days later and ultimately sentenced to death, at one point being the youngest person in the United States on death row. However, his sentence was eventually reduced to life without parole. Whatever the reasons were for Farrell's intense interest and genuine belief in demonic vampires, it would appear many incidents during his upbringing sent him on this chilling path. Perhaps particularly an incident when his mother was arrested for sending inappropriate and sexually charged letters to a 14-year-old boy. She was 34 at the time. These letters made reference to vampires and eternal brides, and given Farrell's young age at the time it happened, it's not hard to see the damage that was clearly done through such actions. Without a doubt, one of the most prolific vampire killers is Andrea Cicatillo, who would murder over 50 people over a 12-year span starting in 1978 across several regions of the Soviet Union. He would most often target young boys and girls, as well as women. He would not sexually assault them upon killing them, but would completely mutilate their bodies, remove internal organs, and of course consume their blood. His first victim was a nine-year-old girl, Yelena Yakiknova, who he abducted and took to a seemingly abandoned house, although it would come to light he had bought the property with the express purpose of committing murder and rapes there. He would proceed to stab her several times before finally strangling her to death. He would then dispose of the body in the Grzevka River. Although it was only two days before her body was found, Chikatilo would continue to kill for over a decade. This in spite of witnesses and evidence able to place him at the scene of that first brutal killing. We might also mention here a silent or indirect victim of Chikatilo, Alexander Kravchenko, who, despite a verified alibi, was arrested for the murder of the young girl. We should note that Kravchenko had previously been found guilty of the rape and murder of a teenage girl several years earlier. He would eventually confess to the murders, but only after threats were being made against his wife, of being charged with perjury and as an accomplice to the murder itself. He would retract this confession in court, claiming he was forced into it. He was still found guilty of the killing, however, and despite the uncertainty, following public pressure from the family of the murdered girl, Kravchenko was executed in 1983. Although it was over two years before Chikatilo would murder again, the pace and regularity of the killings would soon increase. When he was eventually captured and brought to trial, he was kept inside a cage in the courtroom. He was found guilty and executed in 1994. He stated toward the end of the trial that he was a mistake of nature, a mad beast. Right through the modern age, the 20th century onwards, there have been a plethora of such vampire killers. For example, in the late 1980s in Japan, Tsutomo Miyazaki would kill four young girls ages between four and seven years old before mutilating their bodies and drinking their blood. He would even eat one of his young victim's hands. Perhaps what made the murders even worse was that he would then send letters describing the killings to their families. He was eventually arrested for the killings just short of a decade later in 1997. He was sentenced to death and ultimately executed in 2008. In the early 1990s, in the slums of Rio de Janeiro, Marcela de Andrada would embark on a killing spree that would leave 14 young boys dead. Not only had all the victims been raped, but Marcela had also drunk their blood in order to take their beauty. The killer himself was the victim of sexual and physical abuse as a child and lived in absolute poverty. What perhaps makes the killings of Marcela de Andrada particularly intriguing 
is that he was, according to him, a devout Christian and avid churchgoer. He's currently incarcerated in a medical facility with little chance of release. Around a decade before the above killings, in 1980, James Riva would shoot his grandmother with gold-tipped bullets as she sat in her home in Marshfield, Massachusetts. He would then begin stabbing the dying woman in her heart before lapping up the blood that pumped out. It was Riva's belief that he was a 700-year-old vampire who had to satisfy his insatiable urge for human blood. If that wasn't strange enough, though, he would further state that his grandmother was also a vampire, and what's more, she would feed on him while he was asleep. Riva had a long history of mental problems dating to being a young child. Perhaps because of this, he was found guilty of second-degree murder, although it's unlikely he'll be released despite several parole applications. Perhaps one of the earliest vampire killers of the 20th century is Fritz Harman, who is thought to have killed around 27 people, the youngest of which was 10 years old and the oldest being 22 in Hanover, Germany. He would often dispatch his victims by biting their necks, drinking their blood at the same time. Some claims even assert that he would strip parts of the flesh from his victims and sell it privately to like-minded individuals. He was captured in 1924 and executed the following year. Interestingly, so shocked at the crimes, German scientists kept Harman's head so as to study the brain and possibly understand what made him commit such grotesque and violent crimes. Also in Germany, just short of a century later in 2001, husband and wife Daniel and Manuela Ruda would stab a friend, Frank Hackert, over 60 times before finishing him off by taking a hammer to his head. They would then proceed to drink their victim's blood. The couple would not give any real explanation for their actions. They would, however, reveal they were Satanists and had no regrets about the killing. Perhaps, surprisingly, Daniel and Manuela would only receive jail sentences of 15 and 13 years, respectively. Just short of a decade later, in Kenya, in 2009, Philip Oyancha would take the life of at least 18 people, possibly more, before drinking the blood of his victims. Upon his arrest, the 32-year-old would claim that evil spirits had forced him to commit the murders so that he could perform specific rituals and consume the blood. Most of the victims were women, with some being children. According to what he told police, he was part of a blood cult which eventually drove him to murder. Even more chillingly, he claimed it was his intention to kill 100 women. Oyancha remains in prison today, although he claims to no longer be under the influence of the cult. He is not, however, looking to be released anytime soon, in case because members of the occult could easily kill me for having betrayed them. One of the most chilling cases of alleged vampirism occurred several centuries ago, in the early 1600s. Countess Elizabeth Bathory of Hungary was known for the cruel manner with which she would treat women in her service. She would, for example, drench a maid in water if displeased with her and then cast them outside. On occasion, the unfortunate servant would freeze to death in the harsh Hungarian winters. Even more disturbing, though, are the claims of her murdering over 650 women. Perhaps even more disturbing than that are the alleged reasons for the killings. Believing it would give her restorative powers, she would bathe in the blood of her victims. Authorities would ultimately charge her with 80 murders. However, under house arrest, she would die before answering for her apparent crimes. Interestingly, historian Raymond T. McNally would claim in his book, Dracula Was a Woman, that Bathory was at least as much of an influence in the famous Bram Stoker novel. She certainly would have shared a platform with other elite people of the time. And if recent research of trials and transfusions of young blood in order to add years onto people's lives is accurate, perhaps it's knowledge that these elites have been privy to for generations. So there are many accounts of real-life vampires throughout history. And while some of the older happenings are perhaps straying into local legend and folklore territory, as we discussed earlier, many such legends tend to have some partial truths to them. With this in mind, it's probably worth our time briefly considering some of the legends from around the world that, while all speaking of different creatures with different names, are all essentially describing vampires. Might these legends be based on a made, deranged killer from history whose real-life bloodthirst has now become mere legend? 
Or might we find, if we could take a sneak look into the future, that such vampire killers as Richard Chase or Roderick Farrell might be remembered in the same blurred and distorted way? Perhaps the fact that we have accurate and intricate records in the modern age will prevent this from happening. And likewise, the lack of such records from centuries ago has resulted in the perhaps overblown retelling of the accounts over the last centuries. Of course, we should also consider, however unlikely, that such creatures as vampires really do exist. Perhaps they manifest themselves in the bodies of those who they then drive to kill. One thing is for certain, the very real desire in some to consume human blood comes from somewhere, and it has seemingly taken hold of numerous people over the years. Just where does that dark desire come from? Today, the fully restored Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs creates an ambiance that has transcended time while providing all the amenities that the modern-day traveler requires, while also providing the company of a few not-so-modern-day ghosts. That story is up next. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your close-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Perched on the crest of West Mountain above the Victorian village of Eureka Springs, Arkansas, is the historic 1886 Crescent Hotel & Spa. The 78-room resort hotel is not only known as one of America's most distinctive and historic destinations, but also renowned for a bevy of spirits that are said to continue to walk upon these palatial grounds. Built by the Eureka Springs Improvement Company and the Frisco Railroad, the hotel was designed by Isaac L. Taylor, a well-known Missouri architect who had designed several famous buildings in St. Louis. Twenty-seven acres at the north end of West Mountain was chosen for its majestic location overlooking the valley. It was made at an important time in Eureka Springs history as the healing waters of the Ozarks had become well-known nationwide. People from near and far were swarming to the area in hopes of curing their ailments and easing their pains. The Crescent Hotel and spa developers planned to take advantage of these many travelers by building the most luxurious resort in the country. Powell Clayton, a former governor of Arkansas from 1868 to 1870, formed the Eureka Springs Improvement Company to take advantage of this prosperous period. Along with several other investors, the Frisco Railroad joined in on the plan, knowing that the resort could only spur their business. 
Numerous stonemasons were brought in from Ireland to begin the construction in 1884. Due to the density of the magnesium limestone used to build the hotel, special wagons were constructed to move the massive pieces of stone from the quarry site on the White River. Designed in an eclectic array of architectural styles, the masons built 18-inch walls, several towers overhanging balconies and a massive stone fireplace in the lobby. As construction continued for the next two years, more and more workers were hired as electrical lights, modern plumbing, steam heating, an elevator, extensive landscaping, and luxurious decorations and amenities were built into the hotel. Ultimately, the hotel cost $294,000 to build, an extremely extravagant amount for the time. On May 20, 1886, the grandiose Crescent Hotel opened amid much fanfare. The local Eureka Springs Times Echo called it America's most luxurious resort hotel. Notables from across the country attended its grand opening, including a gala ball, complete with a full orchestra and banquet dinner for 400 celebrants. Offering large, airy rooms with exquisite furnishings, a dining room that once seated more than 500 people, and outside amenities that included a swimming pool, tennis courts, and croquet, among a beautiful landscape of flower gardens, winding boardwalks, and gazebos, the luxury of the hotel was unmatched at the time. Immediately, the well-to-do of the nation began to flock to the luxurious resort hotel as liveried footmen met them at the Frisco Depot before transporting them to the inn. Once there, the guest could enjoy the healing waters of the spa and a stable of 100 sleek-coated horses, tea dances in the afternoon, and elaborate parties every evening with a full in-house orchestra. However, the prosperity was not to last. After the turn of the century, people realized that the acclaimed Healing Waters didn't have the curative powers that the hotel and the city were known for. Little by little, people stopped coming to the beautiful resort. From 1908 to 1924, the building was utilized as the Crescent College and Conservatory for Young Women, but continued as a summer resort. However, after operating for 16 years, the revenues from tuition and summer guests were not high enough to maintain the costs of running the large building, and the women's college closed. After sitting abandoned for the next six years, it briefly reopened as a junior college from 1930 to 1934. In 1937, Norman Baker arrived on the scene and bought the aging hotel to open a cancer hospital and health resort. Advertising miracle cures that required neither surgery nor painful extensive tests, the Baker Hospital alleged that its patients would walk away from the resort cancer-free. However, what was unknown to the many desperate patients who flocked to the hospital was that Norman Baker's miracle was nothing more than a scam that he had been purporting on unsuspecting patients for years. The man had zero medical training and was convicted in Iowa in 1936 for practicing medicine without a license. Furthermore, the American Medical Association had condemned the many elixirs sold for several different ailments, including cancer. While operating the hospital, Baker was being investigated by federal authorities and in 1939 was finally arrested for mail fraud. One U.S. Postal Inspector estimated that Baker had made as much as $500,000 per year selling his miracle elixirs through the mail while in Eureka Springs. Baker was convicted to serve a four-year sentence in Leavenworth. The investigation revealed that over the years, Baker had defrauded cancer patients out of approximately $4 million. While no one died from Baker's cure, the investigation showed that his treatments most likely hastened the death of those suffering from cancer when they didn't receive effective forms of treatment. In 1944, Baker was released from Leavenworth and moved to Florida, where he lived comfortably until he died in 1958. During the war years of 1940 to 1946, the beautiful building once again sat empty. However, in 1946, the hotel was purchased by four Chicago businessmen who began to restore the old hotel to its former elegance. Though never at the level of its grand first days in the late 1800s, the hotel again began to thrive. Unfortunately, tragedy struck in 1967 when a fire swept through the fourth floor of the South Wing, and much of it was destroyed. Over the next several years, the hotel passed through several hands as repairs and more restorations were made, 
but it was never fully restored to its original grandeur. However, this all changed in 1997 when Marty and Elise Roenick purchased the historic inn. In May 1997, the couple announced, in five years we pledge to have this grand lady of the Ozarks back to where she was a hundred years ago. But Ozark residents, having heard these promises too many times before, were skeptical. That year, the Roenigs began to rebuild the spas and opened a 6,500-square-foot New Moon Spa, including Vichy showers and hydrotherapy tub, a sauna, massage and therapy tables, tanning beds, and exercise equipment. The next major project was to restore the hotel's skyline, destroyed in the 1967 fire. Costing well over a million dollars, the 3,500-square-foot penthouse, original center observation tower, and the 200-pound, 24-foot-tall crescent moon weather vane were restored. In the meantime, restorations of the guest rooms, lounges, electrical and plumbing and landscaping were also ongoing. On September 6, 2002, Roenig's bold announcement became a reality. After $5 million in renovations, the Grand Hotel had been fully restored to its original stately glory. Today, the Crescent Hotel is one of the most visited hotels in the South. With its long and extensive history, it's also known to be one of the most haunted places in the Ozarks. Staff and guests alike tell stories of several ghosts that are still said to inhabit the old hotel. The most often cited apparition is a red-haired Irish stonemason, who the staff has dubbed Michael. Allegedly, Michael was one of the original masons who worked on the hotel's building in 1885. However, while working on the roof, he lost his balance, fell to the second-floor area, and was killed. This area now houses room 218 of the hotel and is said to be the most haunted guest room. Michael is a mischievous spirit who likes to play tricks with the lights, the doors, and television and often is heard pounding loudly on the walls. Others have witnessed hands coming out of the bathroom mirror and heard cries of what sounded like a man falling in the ceiling. Yet other guests have been shaken during the night, and on one occasion, a patron ran screaming from the room professing to have seen blood splattered all over its walls. From the days when the old hotel served as Baker's Cancer Hospital, the lingering spirit of a nurse dressed all in white is often seen pushing a gurney on the third floor. Only spotted after 11 p.m., when they used to move the deceased out of the cancer hospital, the ghostly spirit vanishes when she reaches the end of the hallway. Others who have not seen the apparition have reported the sounds of squeaks and rattles that sound like a gurney rolling down the hallway. During the 1930s, this area was used as the morgue and even today still houses Dr. Baker's old autopsy table and walk-in freezer. The laundry area is also located on the third floor, where a hotel maintenance man once witnessed all the washers and dryers inexplicably turning on by themselves in the middle of the night. The greedy Dr. Baker apparition has also been seen in the old recreation room in the basement and at the foot of the first floor stairway. Dressed in a purple shirt and white linen suit and looking somewhat confused, the apparition appears identical to old photographs of the infamous quack. For a time, the antique switchboard continued to be utilized in the hotel, but when it continually received phone calls from the otherwise empty basement, the old switchboard was discontinued. It was here, in the basement, that Dr. Baker's hapless patients were often convinced of his miracle cures and handed over their life savings for the treatment. Another remnant of these old hospital days is a ghostly figure who calls herself Theodora. Most often seen by housekeepers in room 419, Theodora courteously introduces herself as a cancer patient, before quickly vanishing. In the lobby, a gentleman dressed in formal Victorian clothing, complete with a top hat, is often been spotted at the bottom of the stairway and sitting at the bar. Described as distinguished-looking with a mustache and beard, many have claimed to entice him into a conversation. However, he sits quietly and never responds before he suddenly disappears. The hotel's crystal dining room is another place in the hotel that is said to contain frequent paranormal activities. Here, other Victorian-dressed apparitions have often been encountered. Many have seen groups of 1890s dancers in full-dress attire whirling around the room in the wee hours of the morning. 
Other reports tell of a 19th century gentleman who's been seen sitting at a table near the windows. When approached, he says, I saw the most beautiful woman here last night and I am waiting for her to return. A former waitress reported that she spied the vision of a Victorian bride and groom in the dining room's huge mirror. The groom allegedly made eye contact with her before the couple faded away. The Victorian spirits that linger in the dining room are said to be very playful. On one occasion, during the Christmas season, the Christmas tree and all its packages were found mysteriously moved to the other side of the room. Additionally, all the chairs had been moved to circle or face the transported tree. On another occasion, staff arrived in the morning to find the dining room in perfect order, except for all of the menus scattered about the room. In the dining room's kitchen, the apparition of a small boy has been seen skipping around, and sometimes pots and pans are said to come flying off the hooks of their own accord. One other often reported spirit is a young female who once attended the Crescent College and Conservatory for Young Women, which was open between 1908 and 1924. According to the tale, the young girl either jumped from or was pushed from a balcony to her death. Today, guests report hearing her screams as she falls. Other apparitions have been sighted in room 202 and room 424, as well as a ghostly waiter carrying a tray of butter in the hallways. Whether you visit the historic Crescent Hotel to get a peek at one of its many spirits, or you want to experience its long history and luxurious accommodations, you will certainly not be disappointed. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at WeirdDarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on any of the sponsors you heard about during the show, find all of my social media, listen to audiobooks I've narrated, sign up for the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host, visit the store for Weird Darkness merchandise, and more. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes. The Vatican is looking for exorcists is by Jody Smith for Cemetery Shift. Vampire Bloodlines is by Marcus Louth for UFO Insight. Hauntings at the Crescent Hotel was written by Kathy Weiser Alexander for Legends of America. The Creepiest Exorcism is by Jacob Shelton for Ranker. And The Possession of Roland Doe is from Rebel Circus. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Isaiah 51, verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. And a final thought. Some of the most beautiful souls have climbed out of the darkest holes. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.